Hello everyone. Today we're continuing our deep dive of Richard Dawkins and Yan Wong's book, The Ancestor's Tale. In this episode, we're going to discuss the evolution of bipedality in hominins. So let's jump right in. <laughs> Our last tale left us about 2 million years ago, but today's tale drops us rather specifically at 4.4 million years ago in the Pliocene. We have now pushed back into the Neogene, the first agricultural revolution, the Pleistocene Ice Age, and even our genus Homo are a few million years in the future. In jumping from 2 to 4.4 million years ago, we have skipped a genus of hominins that was likely directly ancestral to Homo, Australopithecus, existing from 4.5 to 1.9 million years ago. Australopiths all come from Africa, verifying one of Darwin's own predictions about human origins. While other naturalists predicted an Asian or European origin for humans, Darwin noted that both of our closest living relatives, chimps and gorillas, are found in Africa, and thus predicted that the ancestors of humans should be found there. Australopithecus encompasses several species, Afarensis, Africanus, Anamensis, Barel Ghazali, Deiramida, Garhi, and Sediba. As paleoanthropologists frequently fight over what qualifies an individual as a particular species, which of course makes perfect sense in light of evolution, there may be yet more species of Australopith that simply haven't been described. Problematically, since Australopithecus is directly ancestral to our own genus, that makes it a paraphyletic taxon. Some Australopiths, like Australopithecus sediba, are more closely related to Homo than to other Australopiths. Some researchers have even argued that Sediba should itself be classed within the Homo. Further, Australopithecus is ancestral to two other genera, Paranthropus and Kenyanthropus. Attempts at making monophyletic taxa become problematic when dealing with very recent forms and a good fossil record. Imagine if all organisms fossilized it would be virtually impossible to tell one fossil species from another. Let's take an unbroken line of descent between two species of different families. If you adhere to the rules of taxonomy, at some point you logically have to say that the parent and descendant belong to different species, genera, and even families. This is known as the taxonomic boundary paradox. At this point, these questions of which species or which genus a specimen belongs to is like arguing over whether the color pink is a shade of red, or a shade of purple, or a color of its own. However, as with colors, we can still use the names as placeholders while acknowledging that the arbitrary lines between them do not represent some essentialist quality. It has been argued that Australopithecus africanus is closely related to Paranthropus, and that both of these constitute the robust Australopiths. Interestingly, Paranthropus re-evolved a sagittal crest, indicating far more powerful chewing muscles than our ancestors had, indicative of a predominantly vegetative diet. This is also apparent in its much larger molars, which are so large they constitute the term hypermegadontia, the scientific word for super big teeth. An intriguing study came out in early 2021 concerning a Paranthropus robustus fossil designated DNH155, found in a paleo cave dated at between 2.04 and 1.95 million years old. DNH-155 is slightly smaller overall with a slightly smaller cranial capacity and occurs at a bit earlier in time than other robustus individuals. As a result, the researchers who described it argue that this is a clear example of microevolution within the robustus species rather than assigning DNH-155 to a new species. Australopithecus sediba similarly has been proposed by some to be a variation of Australopithecus africanus, although most agree it deserves its own species. On the other hand, the 3.5 million year old Kenyanthropus platyops is a curious hominin. It was contemporary in time with both Australopithecus afarensis and Deiramida, but is significantly different from both. According to a 2016 paper, the diagnostic characters of Kenyanthropus, quote, include a transversely and sagittally flat and relatively orthognathic subnasal region, 
anteriorly placed zygomatic processes and small molars, close quote. Kenyanthropus has been placed phylogenetically close to Paranthropus or to the clade containing Paranthropus and Homo. We must remember that far from the linear idea of progress so popular in the media's representation of evolution, evolution actually produces a branching pattern of nested hierarchies where lineages have the potential to twirl off in all directions. As for Australopithecus proper, this genus holds a special place in human evolution for representing the so-called link between humans and the other great apes, none more famous than Lucy, the 3.2 million year old Afarensis specimen. For example, the face of Australopiths is more prognathic than Homo and the brain case is smaller than Homo. However, the brain case is still larger than that of other extant great apes, which we saw in the previous tale. Further, Australopith incisors are smaller than those of chimps and their tooth rows are intermediate between those of Homo and chimps. Chimp tooth rows are more rectangular, while Homo tooth rows are parabolic. Australopiths fit snugly in between. The attachment of the femur in Australopiths is intermediate between Homo and chimps, but the fingers of Australopiths are slightly curved, similar to chimps. The Australopith foramen magnum, the hole where the spine attaches to the skull, is under the skull like Homo, rather than behind like chimps. The combination of form and magnum position and human-like femur and pelvis indicated to researchers that Australopiths were bipedal like Homo, not quadrupedal like other great apes. Australopiths similarly have valgus knees, foot morphologies similar to humans, such as three arches and a more adducted hallux, and bowl-shaped pelvises with sagittally oriented iliac blades, all of which diagnose a biped in the fossil record, and all of which are present in known bipeds of genus Homo. This helped researchers make sense of the Laetoli footprints in Tanzania. Though the footprints are dated to 3.6 million years old, they are the oldest direct evidence of hominin bipedality and are routinely ascribed to Afarensis. The tracks seem to have been made in what was at the time freshly laid ash. To quote Jerry Coyne, quote, One of the tracks is larger than the other, so they were probably made by a male and female. Other Afarensis fossils have shown sexual dimorphism in size. The female's footprints seem a bit deeper on one side than on the other, so she may have been carrying an infant on her hip. The trail evokes visions of a small, hairy couple making their way across the plain during a volcanic eruption. Were they frightened, holding hands? Close quote. But dating from 5.5 to 4.4 million years ago was a hominin named Artipithecus. This genus has two species currently calling it home, Artipithecus cadaba and Artipithecus ramidus. Artie is the name of specimen ARA-VP-6-500, the subject of today's tale. Importantly, Artie's pelvis is more similar to ours than chimps, but it is still more primitive than even the Australopiths. This makes Artie's pelvis useful in both tree climbing and ground walking. In addition to this, Artie possessed a semivalgus knee and an anterior form in magnum, both traits that diagnose bipeds. The theme of characters intermediate between chimps and humans continues here, but with one exception. Artie had an opposable big toe. This is one good piece of evidence that Artie was still spending a lot of time in trees, possibly making nests in them at night. However, Artie's hands suggest a life involving both arboreal and terrestrial locomotion that is quite different from any great apes alive today. A 2021 paper argues that hominins are descended from suspensory apes who attain bipedalism before leaving the trees altogether. Artie's hallux is actually more divergent than a modern chimp's, and biomechanic work suggests this toe may have been so abducted so as to help stabilize her gait when on the ground while retaining the ability to grasp in the trees. Fascinatingly, Artipithecus ramidus appears to have been sexually monomorphic, meaning males and females had the same body size, and the same canine tooth size. This is interesting, as members of genus Homo, including us, similarly have reduced sexual dimorphism compared to the Australopiths and Paranthropines, where males are much larger than females, although their canines are the same size. Tim White and colleagues have used this monomorphism to propose that Artipithecus ramidus is on the human lineage rather than being a cousin. But this creates an interesting question, as if Artie is ancestral to Australopiths, and they are ancestral to the genus Homo, what caused this Australopith spike in sexual dimorphism? 
Artie firmly rests in the hominin family tree, however, given her species' bipedal adaptations and reduction in canine teeth when compared to earlier Miocene apes. Two other species of hominins predate Artie, notably Sautilanthropus and Aurorin, but neither of these are considered unequivocally bipedal. Thus, Artie gets the tale today. Artie, the Australopiths, and Homo were, or are, bipedal. What's in dispute is how bipedalism arose in hominins. Numerous hypotheses explaining the origin of bipedality have been proposed over the decades. Older hypotheses tended to propose that brain size ballooned before bipedalism originated, so bipedalism evolved to free the hands to tool making and carrying. But this gets the order of events backwards. Brain size took off in Homo, which was after bipedality arose. Another hypothesis proposes that bipedalism arose to assist our ancestors in crossing the African savanna more efficiently, but this seems to have recently been rejected too. Hominins evidently originally evolved in the African woodland, not the savanna. Some researchers have suggested that bipedalism evolved due to sexual selection. Females selected from males who stood more upright, showing off their... um... package... There's nothing intrinsically wrong with this idea, but there's also very little evidence in support of it. One popular idea is that as hominins transitioned from the woodlands to the savanna, bipedal walking could have helped with thermoregulation. After all, when walking upright, less of the body is directly exposed to the sun, and the head is covered with protective hair. Zoologist Matt Wilkinson in his book Restless Creatures is a proponent of this idea. Another possible explanation is that squat feeding in the forest could have helped guide facultative bipeds towards obligate bipedality. The already partially bipedal apes could have adapted to squat feeding on the forest floor by flattening their feet and shortening the length of their pelvic blades, making the pelvis less rigidly tied to the body. Both of these features would have inadvertently pre-adapted the ancestral hominins for bipedal locomotion. It just so happens that having less hand-like feet, shorter pelvic blades, and increased flexibility help in moving bipedally. The refrain of this series is, of course, no single cause is likely the answer. Instead, a variety of causes probably contributed to the evolution of bipedality in hominins. Whatever the cause was, humans are bipedal now, and we are descended from originally quadrupedal apes. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.